Good afternoon and welcome to today's DMA webinar, The Key to Success for Content Marketing Teams, Become Agile, Part 1, sponsored by Minten. I am Mackenzie Hilbig, the Program Coordinator for Education here at the DMA. DMA Education is proud to support informative events like today's webcast. In fact, we provide a number of educational opportunities with our in-person seminars, our live online, and our on-demand courses, a few of which you can see listed here. If you would like to learn more about these and other opportunities at the DMA, please visit the dma.org backslash education. For today's session, please make sure to join the conversation and contribute any questions or thoughts you have by using the question function, which is found on the right-hand side of your screen. We will do our best to address any and all of your questions at the end of the webinar. And for those of you that are on Twitter, our hashtag for the event is hashtag DMA webinar. We hope that you enjoyed today's webinar. And joining us today are Jeff Julian, CEO of Squared Digital, and Matt Dion, CEO of Minton. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Matt Dion. Great, thank you very much, Mackenzie. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to part one of our Agile Marketing Masterclass series. Uh, my name is Matt Dion. I'm the CEO of Mintent, and I'll be moderating the session today. Uh, so, of course, uh, because this is part one, there is a, another part, a part two, uh, which you can sign up for now as well. It's next Tuesday, December 19th, same time, same place. Uh, today, we are going to uh, make an introduction to Agile Content Marketing, and then uh, next week, part two is called Own It. And this is going to cover the characteristics and responsibilities of a good content owner, what you need to know to build a highly efficient content marketing team. So super excited uh, today to have Jeff Julian. Uh, he's the CEO of Square Digital, co-founder at Enterprise Marketer, uh, very renowned speaker, author, content marketer, and agile marketing guru, and uh, a good friend of Mintent. Um, Intent is, uh, just for those of you who don't know very quickly, 30 second overview, we're a content marketing platform. Our application allows you to plan, produce, publish, and measure all of your content in one place. So as you ramp up your efforts and start spending more on, uh, on content, um, a lot of times you will move to a spreadsheet and to a generic project management tool. Uh, and when you kind of hit the wall with that, that's a good time to start looking at a, a content marketing platform. So uh, today in the session, Jeff's going to walk us through the daily challenges faced by content owners and steps that you can take to ensure your team has the information they need. Whether you are part of a team or, the, or you own the team, um, you're going to walk away with actionable advice and tools to help you make the switch to Agile, uh, which will ultimately make your life easier. So we can see from the slide here, uh, this guy, poor guy with his head on his desk. And uh, the question is, why Agile marketing now? Well, I uh, actually looked at a report the other day from Gartner, and it's staggering that uh, marketers are now spending 45% of their budget producing content on their content marketing efforts. So that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, secondly, the uh, CMO now spends almost the same amount of money on technology as the CIO. That, that adds up to 27% of the budget. So we're spending a lot of money and we have a lot of tools and technology. And yet, uh, from a Forrester report that I read, they say that only one in 10 marketers feel they're doing an effective job. So if it isn't the, 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 the budgets and it isn't the technology, then maybe we should be looking at the way that we're doing it, the processes that we're using. And that's why um, we want to talk about agile marketing. Uh, we think this is a very important movement in marketing and can really help take your content marketing efforts to the next level. So with that, um, I am going to turn things over to Jeff. Great. Well, thanks, Matt, and glad you guys could join us today. Um, as we start to kick off this conversation, um, like Matt talked about, the the spend is so high, the responsibility is so high for marketers um, to grasp technology, but then also release content on an interval um, that is acceptable to an audience. And that audience is getting even more and more used to uh, newspapers trying to break into the digital divide, you know, divide between paper and and you know the ones and zeros and so they're pushing content constantly you got netflix releasing new shows and new movies once a week 
Um, and so these binging habits, just the word binge, um, is something that's in our modern vocabulary and it's something that um, our end users are doing, that you know, every customer is, is used to holding the device now. And so how do we reach them with the content, right? And how do we make, make consistent content work for us? Um, it's quite difficult. And so it's all shifting, right? We don't get a print, um, a postcard, and send it out to a handful of people anymore, um, or you know, use traditional tactics, right? The, everything that we are used to using, um, either the social media networks are taking away access to the followers we have, which makes it more difficult. Email is getting harder and harder to get people to open. Commercials, um, people are are not fast forwarding through commercials as much as they used to because they want that time to use their devices, but they're not paying attention. Um, and so finding the audience's attention is very difficult in, in the modern world of marketing. And so how do we do it, right? How do we make content that is valuable to people that get them um, to actually put their attention on this? And that's why we've seen this rise of content marketing because at the core, is producing valuable content. And so with that, and let's look into that the definition because every time I see one of the surveys come out of CMI and it says, oh yeah, all these marketing teams are doing content marketing. If you don't fit the formula, you, you can't say you're really doing it because just updating your website and putting out a blog every once in a while isn't content marketing. Um, you have to look at these five core points. And, and the first one is a focus on building an audience. And so it's, if you think about a concert, um, that audience is being attracted to a certain stage. The music that they're producing is valuable to that person. They're coming around and they wanna hear more. So that's what our content marketing efforts are trying to do is to continue to put out these assets and people are coming around saying, hey, I'd like to be a part of this. Keep, keep it coming for me. So we've seen the rise of podcasting and video and all these other mediums beyond blogging um, that allow us to build an audience. A blog is a content marketing effort for sure, but only when it's about the audience and not about us. And so next step is this long-term commitment to the effort, right? We're going to keep doing this for a very long time. Um, and that's not like a campaign. That's not in the next three months. That's not until our event. It's a long-term effort. Um, and so this thing needs to keep going and going. It has to be driven by providing value. So whatever we're producing needs to be more than a word count. Um, it needs to be more than a bunch of check boxes that says, yes, I have a graphic. Yes, it hits a popular topic, go. Um, we, as Andy Crestedino likes to say, you're, the content you release needs to be the best on the web. So is it the best asset on the web or did you just produce another top nine list of marketing tools for, you know, bullying agencies? Uh, I don't know what it is, but it has to be about that valuable piece. So there needs to be a dollar figure assigned to it mentally of how much value this is. Then you have a regular release of content. It's not just once, and it's not just one big piece of content every six months. This is a regular release, something that they can get used to. Um, and then it has the potential of leveraging mul multiple channels. So once we produce a blog post, we can have a little teaser video, we can have social media posts, we can have graphics and infographics and other things. Um, the big rocks and the turkey slices, as Jason Miller likes to say from LinkedIn. And so if you think about all that stuff and you've got these long-term plans and you've got all these different content assets and this audience that's wanting more and more and more, it's just the planning becomes difficult, right? How do you watch all these things and then watch the internal teams that you're also responsible for? So the sales guy wanting a new slide deck or um, the events team needing, you know, something, a new presentation or something for the trade show. Um, it's very difficult and we need tools that will help us do that. And you know, marketing is not known for the process, um, you know, processes that are generated out of this. Other departments um, are known for that. And so we need better planning strategies. We need better planning tools. We just need the ability to execute this with an idea on a plan that will let us kind of roll out and start to stair step our way through this and to make it possible because without these rhythms, it's very hard to test whether or not we're going too fast, we're going too slow or our content isn't effective at all. 
So why am I here, right? So we've mentioned um, CEO of Square Digital, but that's kind of like the new me. Um, prior to that, and over the past 20 years, I've been a full-time software developer. Um, and I created an online community called Geeks of Blogs. And it came out of, uh, in 2002, um, I was on a very, very early Microsoft blog community and I got into a fight with a guy over what was better, C Sharp or Visual Basic. Um, and everybody knows C Sharp is better except for that guy, so somebody had to set him straight. So we, we continued to write content back and forth at each other and somebody decided to delete my blog that night. You can imagine, right? I come home, 90 blog posts that were well written, but of course I didn't back them up, um, were just gone. And so, that irritation, that anger caused me to go create a blog community. And um, as a software developer, I can say things like that, right? I went home and I spent 10 hours that night writing my own blog engine and releasing um, a blog community. And I wanted to drive uh, other bloggers to have an open voice, to be able to share their thoughts on technology. And over 10 years, it grew into the largest technical blog community. We had 4,000 bloggers, we had 100,000 blog posts, we were posting about 50 a day. So you can imagine what it was like to have to curate your own content, have to you know, find influencers in your own you know, blogger sphere um, and promote all these things that we try to do as marketers with other people. I had it all baked into this community and we, you know, 2 million visitors a month. We're keeping people happy all day, um, every day. And it was amazing. It, it was content marketing, but nobody really knew what that was at the time. And so we had this gigantic castle of content. We had all these new writers coming on that weren't writers. They were software developers. And they needed to be trained to be better writers. They needed to find a voice. They needed to find topics that were interesting. They needed to have feedback from the community to say, hey, here's what the audience is looking for, and to really help them dial in. And so we did that, We and we used the common technology principles uh, from agile software development to help people try to figure out what their backlog was, what the next item was, how to break these things into task and really run through it. And it just, it was amazing. We could work with other companies like Microsoft to help them expand their blog programs and all the time we're showing them agile. And so what is agile? Um, and we can t we'll talk about like the prescription in just a second, but I just want to give you like a walkthrough of what it looks like to be agile and some of the topics that we're talking about. So we have an audience and those are the personas that we we've heard these terms used um, in marketing. It's this group of people characterized by some sort of a demographic um, or a group of demographics or psychographics or whatever um, to make them unique and unique enough to where we can reach them with content. And so once we know who we're reaching, then we define a mission that says, here's what we're gonna do to reach them. And this is just common content marketing principles. Once we know what we're going to do to reach them, then we have to identify who's on our team. And it's not the writers and the graphic designers, um, the videographers, the editors, it's developers. We're developing content. We're gonna all start to learn and use tools from each other and to do different practices than we're normally used to. And so once we have our team defined, then we need a backlog. We need a bunch of work that is prioritized by the greatest uh, need for the audience at the top. And so on those items are things like an estimate, um, a story, uh, descriptions, and how to demonstrate value and how to make this thing a, a true asset. And we start to pick those off and we put them into a couple weeks, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three cycle based off of the amount of people we have in there. And we say, okay, we're gonna fit them these five items in and we're gonna break them down into tasks. We're gonna put them on a board and then daily or, or every other day or whatever your rhythm is, we're gonna come around the board and we're gonna move tasks from the left to the right until we're finished in the, the time box or the sprints over. And then we're just gonna rinse and repeat and continue to do this process for the remainder of our lives or the remainder of this particular content marketing effort. And so that's general what agile marketing is. Now let's get a little bit deeper into some of those details. The first is 
out of the box agile, agile software development, agile sales, agile anything has to have the highest priority on customer satisfaction. So when we're building a new web page, I need to know who my end user is so I know how to build the best web page for that particular user to complete this particular task. And for content, I need to produce the most valuable piece of content for that user so that they're satisfied and they continue to go through this subscription cycle with us. And then the next step after that is I gotta work within a sustainable pace. And that's a, that's a running term. So that's the idea that you have this pace that you can continue, that you, you've built up enough endurance that you could run and you can sustain that pace for a long period of time which uh, another term they like to use in running is the conversational pace. So I could hold a conversation with somebody standing next to me and we would continue to talk and then we, oh, look, two miles just went by and I didn't even notice. And, and if you've never ran before, um, that might sound like it's a hocus pocus, but it's true. I mean, you, you, get, you get to the point to where you can sustain that rhythm. And that's what we want in marketing. We don't want to have a busy season and a light season. We want to have a consistent, sustainable pace that we can run and go and go home and feel accomplished and come back and be ready for work. Then we need the ability to react to change. As things change in the organization and in our customers' minds, we have to be able to move and pivot and change, but not so dramatically that it's a it's a giant shift where we're thinking about trying like a big test like rolling out content marketing right those are small pivots that we can do as we become agile but we react to that change when we see it and then we have frequent deliveries of shippable content so at the end of that time box i need to have a handful of things that i can start to produce and release um, into our content management systems into you know youtube whatever it is but our releasing of that content is not inside of the particular work cycle, it's after. And then we have regular reflection and adaptation. We need to sit back and say, who was good and what was good and who was bad and what was bad and what are we gonna do to fix it? Once we do that, we just continue that cycle. So where did this idea come from? Um, that company at the top, you might have heard of it before, it's uh, pronounced Toyota. And uh, they're a car manufacturer out of Japan. And after World War II, the United States was there on it. We we're going to bring everything back to the factories. We we're going to make, you know, all these new cars, all these new components. And we were going to use an assembly line. And you could think of an assembly line like your marketing team where you have a graphic designer and you have a writer and you have an editor and then you have um, maybe a videographer or maybe um, you know, a social media marketer, let's go with that. And so we get a new piece of content and the graphic guy comes up and says, okay, I'm gonna work on a graphic for that. And then the writer says, okay, I'm gonna start writing on that. And then the writer gets sick. Well, does the video guy start writing? No. This is where the assembly line stops. And that's what happened in Detroit, too, is when they ran out of tires, the cars stopped being produced because they couldn't move them off of the track. They couldn't make any more. And Toyota said, that's not right. We need to make it to where we, when we start to run low on tires, we put somebody into the task of creating tires. And we need to make these our employees have multiple skill sets that they're good at so that way they can rotate around. And so our assembly line or this uh, approach to manufacturing doesn't stop. And so out of that, software developers started to look at these ideas and say, hey, we can't stop either. And just because our database guy went home sick doesn't mean that we get to stop development. We need software engineers writing databases and we need UI designers writing business logic. And we need to all come together and be a full stack developer. And you might've heard that term before if you deal with a lot of IT. And so, we changed, we moved over those, you know, that, that decade that we took to, to get this thing kicked off. And now over 80% of the projects today are done with agile techniques. And so everyone else kind of looked in and said, hey, my, you know, my husband's in IT, he came home and told me about this agile thing. And so I think it could work in marketing or, you know, um, I've, we've attended a lot of meetings and we see all these stickers on the wall 
and we wanted to know what was going on. And so other departments started to pull in these concepts and try it out. And that's why we're here today with Agile Marketing. So let's get kicked off. Let's look at this thing in a little bit more detail. Personas. I am not the foremost expert on personas, but I can tell you where everyone fails is to not have a set of people that they can go to to validate their personas. So we all make up stuff. We all think we know our customers. And so we say, Bob, the truck driver, oh man, he, he loves truck stops. He, uh, you know, he fills up his gas, he runs inside, um, he, you know, he grabs food. So I think advertising in the truck stop, that's gonna be the best thing for us um, to reach him. And it's all just made up stuff. We didn't talk to anybody that looked like Bob. We didn't talk to any types of truck drivers. Um, we just felt that was right. And marketers do a good job of assuming that they know what's right. Uh, it's kind of part of our job. And so we can't do that. We need to have real personas. We need to have you know, LinkedIn access to B2B um, people with the, the premier access where we can find the people that we're looking for that fit that model of the audience. And we start to ask them questions about what they like, what they don't like, what they're consuming. Um, like in marketing today, you could ask everybody if they're consuming video content for education. <laughs> you would find it is like a, a huge you know, no. Um, less than 10 to 15% of the marketers I run into use video content. So do you wanna start a video effort to reach marketers? Maybe, maybe not, but you need to know that about your persona. Um, and so really dig in and find um, what's the truth about your personas because everything we talk about after this point is gonna be based on that fact or that lie. And if we knew we lied about it and we made it up, then we wanna try our best over time to make those lies as fact as possible. And so mission, right? This is the, what our efforts gonna be about, the, the who's and the what's and the when's, right? Um, so we're going to produce blog you know, content for truck drivers with a podcast as well to teach them about the requirements and safety um, of driving you know, on the road trucks. Maybe that's what our, our mission statement is. Or we produce content for doctors um, in the form of video and audio to teach them about changes in the industry and best practices. Um, those are all great mission statements. And what those do is they align us with an effort. So where if we're talking to the doctors about changes in their field, we're not gonna release the post about social media because we know it's gonna have the best SEO value and we can get a link from here and there. And, and I know it's, it's um, just gaming the system, but we're gonna do it anyway. That would never fly um, because it doesn't fit within the whole that we've defined with our content mission statement. So now let's talk about those roles on our team. This is the place where a lot of people get upset um, because they just don't see themselves ever doing anything else, right? It's I went to J school and now I'm a journalist and I'm a corporate writer and I write, I type on a keyboard. I have manual typewriters at home. That's just who I am. So if you think I'm gonna open up Canva or Photoshop or anything like that, you got another thing coming. Well. Disruption change, you know, disruption is making that change. And we need to be more renaissance oriented when we think of ourselves as marketers. So what are the majors and minors that we can have in marketing? What are the things that I'm a specialist at? Um, and I go really deep on these areas, but then I go a little deep in some of these other areas that it gives me more general um, responsibilities. And so the first role is a content owner. And this guy is responsible for answering questions and, and making decisions about the backlog and the audience. And that's it. They don't have to be a content creator. Um, they don't have to be your boss. Um, they just have to have the authority to say, this is what goes next on this particular team for this backlog. Um, and and they, by that very nature, they usually have to do some blocking and tackling. So you wanna have somebody with a little bit of authority in your organization to be that content owner, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the director of marketing or the CMO or the VP of anything. Um, it could just be the guy everybody likes and he can, and he knows the customers really well. Um, that might be your content owner. 
Next, we have a new term for most of us called the Scrum Master, and we'll go ahead and introduce the other term associated with that word, which is Scrum. Scrum is a, def a definition of Agile. So Agile is the methodology, those five steps, and Scrum says, here's a way to put this into practice using those five steps and, and encompassing those five steps in a way that lets us do work. And so a scrum master, it's a rugby term. It's the guy who organizes um, what we're going to do when we're running the ball around and we got this big huddle and a circle around the ball. Um, and the scrum master is the one that's kind of telling everybody what to, where to go and what to do. And so on our teams, that's the guy who's doing all the blocking and tackling when sales comes down and says they want something. Um, that's the guy who's doing, you know, who's talking to the new guy, trying to get him up to speed on the way we do things. They're the person that um, sets up the meetings, that coordinates any issues that are coming up and tries to get rid of them. They can be a content creator, but their time will be limited. So um, you can look at internal resources that are already Scrum Masters or other people on your team or people that you want to bring into your team um, in this role. And there's tons of certification and books and courses about how to be a really good Scrum Master. And then finally, we have content developers. We have people who can develop content. And I love that term because it gets us out of those silos that we're all stuck in. Um, and lets us as a team focus on an audience and do whatever we have to to produce content that reaches that audience. So we're not waiting on everybody and we're starting to co-learn and co-mingle um, with each other and the tasks, tasks that we're responsible for and allows us to understand and build that cohesion and the rhythm and momentum we need to produce content assets on a regular basis. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to death to think of a writer starting to, to learn how to, how to tweet effectively um, and to open up Photoshop. And I, I love the idea of bringing in videographers and helping them have them teach our team on how to grab a camera and capture some video or maybe how to cut down a big edit into a two minute clip that we're gonna put out on social and put titles on. That's, that's the future of content marketing. That's where people are gonna go. And so we're team, our team's ready. Now we need some content. Now we need to know what we're doing. And that's where the backlog comes in. But the backlog's just a list of content. Let's get into what the nitty gritty of that backlog is, and that's the content item. And it's just an individual item itself that sits on a stack. Um, and that stack is prioritized by what is most, or what needs to happen next, essentially. Um, and it's going to be in greater detail. And the further down the stack you go, you get less detail, you get less um, kind of uh, individual items, you get more groups or ideas, or wouldn't it be cool ifs, um, until you get to the bottom and to some of the most undefined, unimportant pieces of content for this particular moment. And so let's look at what a content card might look like. Um, at the top, we have a title. And that little number off to the right, that's an estimate. And we'll talk about how we get to estimates um, in a little bit of detail, but um, there in future uh, webinars and then other content um, inside my book, I get into a lot more detail on estimates. Um, then underneath that, we have a story. And the reason I start with a story instead of a headline is because I don't want to capture your attention with this piece of information. I want to capture the attention of the team to make sure that this is a valuable asset. So I want to define the story of what that produce, what that person, that, that persona that we're writing for, what they're going to do with this piece of content and why it's necessary. Um, because if it is just that list of social media tools, man, there's some out there and there's tons of them out there. So maybe it's a, a best of what's it going to do? Why is it going to be the the valuable thing, why is this even needed to live on the web? And if we asked ourselves that question more often, we would find that we're moving things down the stack more frequently and then off the stack too, because it's truly not valuable content. Um, and we're not wasting anybody's time. I don't know about you, but I absolutely hate when I read an article that has an amazing headline and it just sucks. It doesn't give me any information. I didn't learn anything. I wasn't even entertained. Um, and I wasted my time. And I remember those brands when they do that to me more than I remember the brands that actually treat 
you know, create valuable assets. So you got to look at this portion very carefully and spend time doing it. And once we define this statement about a story about how this person is going to use this content or what the reasons that they would find it valuable, now we have to go down and list out the ways, the individual ways we actually plan to accomplish that. We call that a how to demonstrate in value. And so this is acceptance criteria. This is what we need to do to make sure this thing is complete. And so maybe it's a, we do some research on this. We put out a user survey. We come up with the top five list um, of something. Um, we have uh, enough copy and a video to go along with it. So these are the ways that we would say, okay, this is how this piece of content is going to live and be valuable. Then we have a call to action. And this call to action is not inward focus. Um, it's what is the call to action to the customer? What is the step we want them to take? And it better not be to sign up for our email list like the one I said here, right? What do we want them to do to move forward to grow as an audience member? Because that's why people come back and that's why people grow. They are not excited about signing up for your list and they do not want you to blast emails to them constantly. They want you to entertain or educate them with valuable assets. And so the other fields on there is priority, the, the state of, you know, the, the priority in the stack, what's the most, the highest priority, and then the state. Content lives and then it gets old and then it can either die or it needs to be refreshed. And so um, as we start to see that our content efforts need to have more updates to our existing content than they do um, new pieces of content, uh, the, the more we're going to start to see some cards get flushed out again and again and again over and over. And so once we have that big item, it doesn't have to be the individual task, right? It doesn't, we still need to know that we need to write the copy. We still need to know that we need to create the graphic, but we're talking about the bigger piece of content itself. And so later we actually do break things down into individual tasks and put them on a board and do work. But that is not the content item. So don't think when you're defining these, you have to go through and define the, the 10 steps that you guys do to create blog posts. So next, we go back to that backlog now that we started creating all these guys and we have our content owner prioritize it. We say, look at the list, tell us what the next item is that we're gonna work on and then the one after that and then the one after that until we have enough that we can fit into our next iteration. And so the estimating topic that we talked about earlier, there's a technique that we do called planning poker in Agile, um, or there's sizing. So we could say that we have a small, a medium, and a large, and we give that a relative size to amount of days. Um, but I don't necessarily like that approach for marketing. I like the idea of using planning poker. And what it is, is the sequence of numbers. And it starts with one, and goes to two, then it goes to three and it skips four and goes to five and it skips six and seven and it goes to eight and then 13 and then 20. Why does it do that? Because if I ask you if this blog post is going to take one or two days, well, that's a pretty big gap between those numbers. It's, you know, a double of the, the other one. But if I say, what's, you know, is this a, is this, you know, ebook going to be 12 or 13 days? I don't know that, I don't know. Right? I can't even fathom like looking at that and trying to determine, you know, definitively it's 12 or 13. So the further something is out or the larger it is in scope, the, the more variation we need between it that will allow us to make mistakes on the high end and the low end. So sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong, um, but we, we just know it's bigger than the previous iteration. And that gives us the ability to kind of allow for the hurricane to be way off the coast and it could hit either Florida or, you know, Texas. And then as it starts to come in, we can say, okay, Florida's in the clear, but you know, it's Houston that it's going to hit. Those are the kinds of forecasting and estimating techniques we want to do with the amount of data we have. And so we have this time box, right? We have this sprint and scrum is what they call it. And it's a start date and an end date. And for developers, software developers, or content developers, this is your deadline. Um, so what we're saying is when we start on this date, you're going to have five days, maybe 10 days as a team to produce these assets. Can you do it? And you look at the numbers and you say, yes, we can. 
and then you're going to do it. Um, you're going to work an extra night if something happens, or you're going to finish a little early and get a reward, or, or take the time to produce, um, to go back to the backlog and reestimate because you were better than you thought. Um, but that time box is our goal. That is our reward, and it's kind of that that thing that we have, that stake in the ground, and we determined it. Not, somebody else didn't tell us what the deadline was, and that's one of the greatest parts about it. So if we look at what a planning period for uh, a sprint would look like, we'd say, here's the four members of our team, and even though it's a 15-day sprint, we're a marketing team, we can't commit full-time to content marketing, so we're going to let Hunter and Tammy produce the majority of their time on um, content. Sally's going to split her time, and then George is new, and he's got a lot of, you know, upkeep to do, so he's doing six days. And so out of this, we have 36 days of development time in here. And so because we're learning new skills and because we have meetings and because we have all these other things, um, we need to have an efficiency factor, which means that we're just not working all day every single day. We have about an hour of time, you know, in general that we're either going to some other meetings or um, you know, reading the book, getting to work, walking around between offices, whatever it is. Um, we're just not 100% effective. And so out of that comes 28 points. And we changed the terminology here because it's not a day, it's a number of points that we can go back and spend on the backlog. And so we look back at the backlog and we see a 13, that's the next item, so we pull that one in. And now we've got you know, now we subtract that 13 from the 28. We got 15 more points to do with, and we go grab an eight. That's the next item. And so we got seven, and then it's a five, and a three, and a two. Well, maybe we just grab that five and we leave that extra one off because we're new at this, or we skip one and we grab that two and we finish it out with the full 28 points. Um, and that's, those are the content pieces that we're going to accomplish. And we look at it and we kind of mentally break it down to see what it fits and like who's going to be on what team and when and, and the skill set. And once we know it, we commit, we grab our scrum board and our scrum pads and we create a board and we throw everything up there and we have our first stand-up meeting. And so what's a stand-up meeting is we look at the content items and the task on the board. And we say, okay, I'm going to work on this item. And I walk up there and I say, this is what I'm doing today. And the next person comes up and says, this is what I'm doing today. And we could put these little stickers on it to identify who is what. Um, but most likely, you know, if a small team will know. And then tomorrow comes around and we finish some work and we come up and we say, this is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm going to do today. And automatically we have this list of content. It looks like a Trello board if you ever use Trello. Um, but it's a, a list of content that's big on the left, small on the right, and then over time it gets bigger and bigger. But everybody can see what's going on. And then my favorite part of Agile is the public shame, is when somebody doesn't get something done because of something that was in their control, but they let it get out of control. And so they say, you know, when you walk up to the board and you I didn't get this done. So I've got to work on this. I misestimated it. Um, and that lets the team grow. We need that. We need the ability to have each other to be accountable because if we completely missed an entire day's worth of work, we're going to have to make it up somewhere. And the team needs to know that we have to make it up. And so that's my favorite part of Agile, but that's usually because I'm the, the scrum master or the, the owner of the backlog, and um, I like to see um, people grow. And so... We'll skip this approach for today, but there's another approach called Kanban, which is a very similar board. Instead of having a time box, it has buckets and the a maximum amount of fluid or content that could fit into those buckets, which then forces it down the line. But it doesn't protect it from going backwards. And so it's something that you graduate to in most marketing efforts rather than to start with um, Kanban. So our stand-up happens, and we do this every single day. And then at the end, we have that retrospective meeting, that meeting where we find out who went well and who was bad and what part of our process we want to change. Um, and it's a slow, small, you know, adaptations. These are things that we do. Um, we listen to the audience. We look at, you know, analytics forms at this point. Um, we, we look at the survey results. Whatever it is, we, we take this time to see how we can be better as a team. 
And then we go back into planning and review and we just keep going over and over and over again. Just repeat that process. And that's why I love it because at home I have scrum boards and we, we do agile home schooling, we do agile family stuff, we go on a trip, we do backlogs. My wife is a certified scrum master. Um, we do agile everything, you know, and it just works. The process can be repeated. You can put it into all different areas of your life. Um, but when it comes to marketing and content marketing, it is a very good fit and it's solid. But there's some important points of failure um, that we're going to cover real quick. And you can start asking some of your questions, too, at this point. Um, and, and I'll run through some of the ones that I've heard over the past five or six years teaching agile marketing to people and some of the problems I see that they have. First, everyone is like a... It's, it's like a first time visitor at a buffet. They just keep filling up their table, you know, their plate with all these items and it's stacked up, you know, six inches high and it's gonna be hard to get back to the table when it comes to workload. It's like get, like, first thing I do is I fill my day with tasks when I get into work and I don't leave any time or any effort or any budget for anybody coming by and adding more stuff. And so I just keep stacking up stuff. And then I go home frustrated because I don't feel like I got anything done today because the workload tomorrow has all that stuff and it's hard to get out of that cycle. And so we do need tools and practices that don't allow people to come in and add stuff to our workload. But then we need the ability to measure and be consistent and confident in our workload and only put the amount of items on there that we need to. That way, when we go home at the end of the day, we feel fulfilled. We can put work away. We can put our cell phones away. We can hang out with our kids um, or, you know, go to the park, whatever you want to do. And then the next day, be excited about work and doing more work. We need to remove disruptions. And this is Big time important when it comes to the arts and crafts department of the organization, I mean, the marketing team, right? Everyone thinks of us as colors and crayons and we produce everything for you. So just come by and ask for something and, and we'll ship it out and get it ready for you or the, where the kink goes, right? Just give us that sheet and we can push it out and we'll get you a thousand people signed up for your next event. That's not how marketing works. And those disruptions continue to come in over and over and over again. And we need the ability to make them stop. Um, and we need, so we need a person in place. We need a process in place and we need buy-in from the organization that says, look, if we don't look forward in our business and we don't start producing assets that attract people to, to our business, we're not going to be able to sell anything to them. And so this is very important that we have that job of looking at the periscope and seeing where things are going and, and trying new things and reaching new audiences and disruptions just slow us down. And then we need to move in small steps that we all get excited. You know, we go to an event and somebody gets up there and says, you know, Snapchat for B2B. I love Carlos Gilly, he's an awesome guy. But he gets up and says, Snapchat for B2B is awesome. We all go home and go, woohoo, we could do snaps for work. And we grab our cell phone and we're like, I don't know what to take a picture of because I work at a, a steel mill or something like that, right? And so, but we're in it we're focused on it. We took a giant leap into saying, this is what we're gonna do. But in Agile and in, in marketing, digital marketing, we gotta take small steps where we know what's gonna happen. Think of Bill Murray and you know baby steps to here. Um, and what about Bob, right? Tiny, tiny steps as you go through this process. And then define what done is. People will start to take some of that extra stuff off their plate and put it in their napkin and say they're going to do it later, right? They'll get up to the board and they'll move the card and they'll say, yeah, I'm done, but they know they're not done. And they're just hoping that when they get back to their desk, they'll get 30 minutes to finish. And it, it's either not a, it's a pride thing and they just want to be like, I'm done, or it's, it's a timing thing. It's like, I'm, I'm done. I'm just going to tell everybody I'm done. I know I can get it done. Um, but it's not done. And so by not being done, you can start to calculate some of that and you can think of it as debt. Just put a little bit on the credit card and a little bit more on the credit card and a little bit more on the credit card. And all of a sudden the credit card's near max because it's you've just combined the debt. You've never focused on paying it off. And so that's what definition of done does for us. It allows us to look at a blog post and to say, well, I know you moved it, but here are the criteria that we use to say this is done and we missed these steps. So now we got to finish it before 
um, we move that card. And so that's when we either create a new card or another, uh, or we move that task back until it's truly done. And so finally, the last step is build that endurance that when you take those small steps, make sure you're setting a little bit bigger goal, but not a giant goal. Don't go out to run a marathon, go out to run a mile and set that to be your first month, you know, kind of goal and then spend time working up to a mile. Um, and then you can accomplish those goals and then you can set the next big goal, but you need the endurance. You need the ability to say you've done this for a long enough period of time and that's why you're good at the rhythm. And so when you're looking at new people to join your team, look at their endurance. Don't look at the, what they produce because that what they're producing is what a team's producing. Look at their ability to be steadfast, to run through this and to do it over and over and over again and grow as a team. So, Matt, kind of bring you back in and yeah, uh, answer awesome, some Jeff. questions. Yeah, thank you very much. I just uh, want to remind everyone, uh, this uh, is, is recorded. And uh, if you want to share it you know, with other members of your team and whatnot, um, it will be archived on the DMA site and, and on our website at Mintent, uh, on our web, sorry, www.getmintent.com. Uh, if you like what you heard today and you want to hear uh, more kind of the, take it to the next level uh, next Tuesday um, at uh, one o'clock Eastern time. And we'll be archiving that one as well. If you can't make it, uh, I know Jeff, uh, you know, great, great topic and great content. I know you do uh, do webinars or sorry, uh, workshops around this. Um, and so if anyone's interested in that, you can reach out to, uh, to Jeff, but um yeah, with that, uh, why don't we turn it over to um, Mackenzie? I think you have some uh, questions uh, on deck here. Yes, I do. Um, we have a few questions that have come in. And the first question is, what software is available to help implement an agile me methodology? What tools do you recommend to use for documentation of items such as backlog, definition, of what done is, time estimates, personas, content mission statements, roles, goals, workflows. Yeah, so there isn't one platform out there that does all of those. Um, and not even in the software side of the world is there one platform that does all those. And that's, it's because the the methodology itself or the the definition of itself leans itself to allow you to change and allow you to make changes and it's hard for software to be defined in a flexible matter that has workflow associated with it that allows people to change and not have to like be trained on it so the if you go to the farthest end of the spectrum or the closest thing to um just pure agile software, you've got tools like Jira um, from Alassian that will, you know, from a development perspective, you can create boards, you know, at, out in our living room, I've got a giant touch screen that I can pull our Jira boards up and I can slide it, my hands across the screen and it, it mimics picking up cards. Um, and I can put estimates in there and customers can look into it and they can create different types of content. Um, and then I can have software tasks on there too. And all these other things and all this reporting, but it's a, it is hard to customize and configure that thing because it's so flexible. They have to make it to where you define the flexibility in it. Um, and then tools like Mintent, um, which are content management platform or content marketing platforms that are coming out of the traditional editorial calendar. Um, and they're starting to see that the end of the month doesn't mean anything to a content marketing effort. It's really what the team is, what they're going to define as their workload in that time box and how many they do it. Only as if we're printing a monthly magazine does the end of the month usually mean anything. Um, and so maybe we can put in agile tools into this. And so now they're like Matt and his team are adapting and adding new functionality and features to maintain all the time to make it more agile and start to come from the right over to the center. Um, and so it's usually a blend of a lot of software. And Matt, you definitely have seen the space and, and know what's what's going on with content. Yeah, no, for sure. I think today it, it is a combo of things. Um, but uh, like you said, uh, content marketing platforms certainly 
does a bunch of it, you know, allows you to see all your tasks on a calendar, allows you to do workflows, allows you to measure when you, when you do experiments you want, and you want to see if it's successful. Like say you start with a blog post and you see that it's been popular. So then you roll it into maybe a webinar or something of the ebook. Um, if anyone would like to see a content marketing platform in action, uh, there's a trial on our website. And uh, also we'd be happy to give anyone a demo and show how it supports uh, either, you know, getting yourself organized in an effort to move towards agile or whether you're already on agile and using, you know, uh, a board or a spreadsheet and want something more sophisticated, we can show you how a content marketing platform would support your, your efforts. And like Jeff said, there, there, there's a few other pieces around the edge, some other tools we can recommend as well. Uh, but we are moving this direction. We think agile marketing is, is the way to go and uh, we'll be evolving our platform to wrap around those processes even more as we move forward. So, Yeah, and, and like I said earlier in the presentation, it took software developers about 10 years before we had good software. Um, while we're using it. And so we use paper um, for, you know, the better part of a decade and I still use paper. I, you know, I'm the guy that goes into Office Max and gets excited when I see Post-it notes um, and, and buys them just by the, the truckload. Um, and Sharpies, you know, I don't, I always have to have at least 10 Sharpies around me <laughs> with different colors and everything because I document so much stuff on paper. Um, and there's there's goods and bads to that, but I have other tools that I use for the things that I'm not good at, which is like the publishing process or the things that I can automate that I'm not automating the customer interaction. I'm just automating the steps that are repeatable, right? And that's one of the differences, like my view of, of marketing automation is how do we automate the things to allow us to step up a little higher and create better content and not how do we automate the, the, you know, an email that puts somebody else's name in there and, and fakes a conversation that never happened. I, I think that's, you know, using the robots incorrectly. Um, and so the things that I'm decent at are taking paper, writing down tasks and moving them on a board that's on the wall behind my computer. Um, and so I don't have to use software for that. Great. We have a few more questions. On Next question is, how do you manage the review process and are multiple edits from executives in this process? Yeah, so com let's think of legal and compliance too, right? And because I've, I've heard a lot of people, um, I've never had to, you know, I've always been an agency and so usually let the customer see it and what the customer sees and likes and that's kind of your compliance department. But there's other teams that no matter how hard they try to learn what is compliant, um, they still have to go through a legal process and or a review and things will always come back that are just, you know, somebody doing busy work. And so back when I was talking about shippable content, right, at the end of our sprint, we have potentially shippable content. What that means is we're done with it, but we're not necessarily shipping it. Right, it's got to go through quality assurance. It's got to go through some other steps. So, so that at that point, it would go over to compliance after the end of your time box, and then you don't have any control over how quickly they're going to get something done. There's no guarantee. So it could be a day, it could be two weeks. Um, one of the clients I had, they sent something over to legal, and it took six months. So um, that's that's just what they had to deal with. Um, and so what comes back is either a change request, it could be a bug. Um, I like to use the term bug in our content because now you can start to get that feeling of thinking it was done and then it comes back and it wasn't quite done. Um, and how are you gonna fit that in? But it comes back and then you determine, does it go through another step in the process of publishing? Is it automated into it at that point? The, or do we put it back on the backlog and in the next sprint, we pull it in and we finish it up and we do the work associated with that. Um, so that's usually the way I do it. If it's got to go to an agency or any other outside source that you have no control over their time frame, um, that's it has to be done at the end of the sprint. And sometimes that means you have to have shorter sprints than what you're comfortable with because you have to have all these other people involved. Thank you. And our next question is, how do you manage the review process? And that was 
from a previous question. And we have another one that I want to get to. Let me pull this out. How do you break past the stigma in creatives that you can't put a time box on creativity slash ideation? Oh, yeah, this is where I got to pop the bubble and make all the little starving artists quit floating around the room, right? Um, I, I stood up at the UXPA uh, international event during one of their Agile sessions, um, and I, I said, you guys are missing it. You have to have estimates. The estimates are the only thing that make this work, because if you're going to go ask for more budget, you have to know how much it takes to get something done. So that, that way you can actually have real numbers behind the assets you're producing on why they're valuable. So if I can go say, we're producing $2 million worth of revenue with this content marketing effort, but right now we're at capacity, and if I have an extra three resources, I can get to $4 million of revenue, look at all the numbers and research I did with all this cool data we have, I mean, you're going to get that budget. But if you go in there and say, well, our creative guys don't know how long it's going to take to get the graphic done, um, well, then they're just going to look at you and, and send you back to the arts and crafts division. Um, and so you, everything has to get done You, if you, in a certain amount of time, and you just allow for yourself to complete it in that time. If you give yourselves five days to do something, you can produce something in five days. You can produce a video, a documentary, a 30 minute long documentary in five days. Um, you could produce a graphic in five days. Will it be the best graphic? Maybe not. Five days sounds like a lot of, a lot of time for me, um, but it's not me determining that, it's the team determining that, and then they're gonna rally around and say, is five days enough? And if it is, great. If not, we're gonna push for eight, which means we're gonna produce less content, but we're gonna have more valuable content. Um, but every single piece of work in a creative team can be estimated. It's just if it's an agency telling you that, usually it's because they don't want to get in the fixed bid situation um, or they're, um, they have so much stuff on their, work, their plate that it's hard for them to fathom what it's going to take. But you should have time in your day that you spent being creative that is unestimated, that is just relaxation and clearing your mind time and um, meditation. But it should not be the work. Work is every amount of work, a piece of work can be estimated. And you just have to have the hard conversations with people. Great. I think we have time for one more quick question, which is, how do I get my own team to adopt this? Yeah, I threatened to slash tires, um, so that might work. But no, it's um, it depends on the size of your team. If you're a pretty decent sized company, and uh, one of the mm -hmm. things I focus on is enterprise marketers. So if you are um, kind of like a team of 10 or more, um, find a small like a corner of your marketing effort and do that with like two or three people and just use it as kind of an experiment to say, okay, we're going to take these three people and they're going to work on this in this agile approach. Um, we're going to send them training or um, to get them a book. You know, you can get them my book. And if you go to enterprise marketer and sign up for our email list, I'll give you a free copy. Yeah ebook copy of it so you can get started and you can unsubscribe right after. I don't care. Um, but just get them information that they need to get going and then watch it and let it grow. And then if that works, then bring in somebody to coach and train you, bring in a workshop and, and have them help you with the strategy long term. Don't just use them as a teacher, use them as the strategist and get it to roll out um, because it is a, it's a long term effort. Like I said, and it's all baby steps. So tomorrow, get your team to update their personas and maybe define the mission statement, right? Joe Polizzi says every year, all these content marketing efforts aren't working and all these content marketing efforts aren't, have no written strategy and don't have a documented mission. We'll start there, right? And then start to make yourself work in different silos. Get yourself, you know, time with the videographer and sit at their desk and watch them edit and have them describe what's going on. In software, I seriously spent time with people doing what's known as pair programming, which is how we learned to do this. 
where somebody would have control of the mouse and the other person would have control of the keyboard or it, sometimes it was that intense, sometimes it wasn't that intense, um, but you would work on something and somebody else was staring over your shoulders and then like a few minutes later, they would work on it and you were standing at their shoulders um, because you were teaching each other how to do the full stack. So the database guy would sit there and he'd write a SQL statement and I'd watch what he's doing and then I would go out and I'd create the connection to talk to the database and he'd watch what I was doing um, and we'd see how the full thing was built and we learned that way. And marketers can take that same step and go and do their education that way um, and just let us grow and, and become more full stack marketers. Thank you for answering the questions that came in, and thank you all for listening in today. And a special thank you to Jeff Julian and Matt Dion for such an informative webinar. We will be sending out the recording and PDF of the presentation within the next 48 to 72 hours. This concludes our webcast. Thank you all for joining us today, and enjoy the rest of your day.